Hey listeners, welcome to another episode of Brown Girl Street podcast. This is your host Taman Tiwana and this is Kathy Thakur and both of us love reading books. On this podcast we bring our favorite books to you and discuss the parts that were most meaningful to us and how we found them interesting or relatable as brown girls. Kathy, you realize this is our last episode of 2020? Yeah, you know, I don't know how this year went so quickly. It feels like only yesterday when we were talking about starting a podcast and now here we are. I know. And before we even move on to our episode today, I want to take a moment and just feel grateful for this amazing year. As this episode will air, it will be like one year anniversary of this venture for us. Yeah. And Thanks to all of you who have listened to our episodes, supported us and shared your love for Brown Girls Read. Thank you everyone who have been a part of our community and people who have loved us and supported us and not forgotten to show their love to us. You have been the reason we have kept going. I agree. I agree. And now coming on to our episode Today we have Megha Majumdar joining us for a conversation about her debut novel A Burning. If you haven't listened to our discussion of the book, go check out the previous episode now. And we will bring Megha on after this quick word from our sponsor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. It's free. There is creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Today we want to tell you about a book by a brown girl. Half Woman Half Grief by Maya Kalaria invites us to grief. Having lost her mother at the age of 9, Maya has spent her life exploring the myriad of emotions which surround death. In her debut collection of poetry, she maps her journey into the mysterious underworld of grief and the extraordinary lessons she learned in the darkness. A lifelong poet and writer, Maya speaks from a place of truth, trauma and healing for anyone who has experienced grief of any kind, personal, collective, environmental and colonial. She vulnerably explores the desperate sadness, fury and shame she experienced on her healing journey and helps others to do the same. The book is available at www.mayakalaria.com. Hey Megha, welcome to our podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much Daman, thank you so much Kathy for having me. First of all, congratulations on huge success of your book. It's getting so many award nominations. It must feel so great, right? Thank you. It has felt really surreal, you know, because especially because it came out during such a tough year in the middle of, you know, people suffering from illness and and loss and losing jobs. And so it's just been a really tough year. So to have something small to celebrate during that year has felt really strange actually. Yeah, and even like reading your book in this you know in 2020 gave us hope <laughs> i mean although the the ending is kind of sad but you <laughs> know you don't it's... give it away already <laughs> <laughs> well like kathy mentioned the topic is kind of sensitive especially with the ongoing governance and political climate in that country we were very curious what made you choose this for your debut novel hmm You know this book came out of really reading the news and watching what was happening in India. I grew up there. Um I finished high school there. My parents still live there. All of my extended family is there. So it's a place that I I still feel very connected to and I as I was reading the news about the rise of this kind of hatred filled ideology and this extreme nationalism I was thinking about well how does an ordinary person make their way through this you know how does somebody hold on to their ambitions and their jokes and their humor and their spirit throughout this time so it felt like I was kind of absorbing what was going on and responding and that became this novel was your research just around reading or did you actually visit india or some of these states did interviews with people who were in some of those incidents 
like how did you get such real accounts of people in your story um i appreciate that a lot of my research was really following journalism i read ethnographies i have a background in anthropology so i really always turn to ethnographies part of it was coming out of things that i had observed just from growing up in india and being surrounded by people part of what i really wanted to bring into the book for instance was you know this idea of how people are inventive on a very daily basis and very creative and really funny every time i go home now that's something that i'm struck by is you know you have problems like the last time i was home we were visiting a relative and the road in front of her house was just like being dug up for some kind of repairs or something and so nobody could go in or out and then i don't know if you both remember but there used to be these times where there were things like shortages of certain coins like you wouldn't get 1 rupee coins or you wouldn't get 5 rupee coins and so when you went to the shop people would get around that by giving you you know a little piece of candy equivalent to that value <laughs> in exchange for change so just things like that i think people find their ways around systemic problems in these hugely creative ways and that was something that i wanted to bring into the book that's so great that you noticed all these things you know like uh, when we have been growing up in india it just becomes a part of your everyday so you don't see it as something extraordinary or out of the world right <laughs> that's so yeah. true that's so true and i wonder like do you both feel that way i mean i'm guessing you grew up there too and now you live abroad do you feel that you're able to notice more about where you grew up because you have this distance I think I do and every time I go to India it just feels a little bit different to me now I can see a little bit more difference between the US and India and the way we grew up and so I keep making jokes about it to my parents uh, because the, the way of living in India is so different from the way you live here right it's so mm -hmm. social everyone's like with each other all the time they want to talk to each other all the time your neighbors your friends and here it's kind of like just individual like alone So yeah there is definitely a difference in the way we grew up and it becomes so more stark true. with every visit that we make and mm -hmm. i think you can't help but compare when you become of two lands right it's kind of a immigrant living that you move to a new place then you always have this benchmark of where you grew up and then everything you experience after that is sort of coming as comparison that is so true yeah i love the title of the book a burning how did you come up with the title did you come up with the title <laughs> i love this question because i'm very bad at titles and i really struggled with it and actually it was after many conversations with my agent who is really great we landed on a burning i think i wanted something that was visual and of course there's a very literal burning in the beginning of the book and hopefully as the book goes on a reader might think about the flames of nationalism that are being fanned throughout the country as well to me i thought it was kind of synonymous with how there was a burning inside jeevan as well to become rich mm. to do something you know extraordinary out of her life even though she was from a really poor background So yeah I, I always get thinking it's very that. reflective of how the country is burning in some sense. Mm, <laughs> That's yeah. how I read it. I love all these different readings. <laughs> <laughs> to come back to the book a little bit there are some characters in the book you haven't given a name to like PT sir but they play such an important part in the story as well. I'm curious to know like what was your idea behind that? That's a great question. You know, I think I stuck with the names as they originally came to me and I tried fiddling with the names a little bit, but something about it just felt off. You know, if I tried to name the character, PT Sir was kind of how I always saw him, probably drawing on, you know, my own childhood and going to school where we would call the the physical training teacher you know pt sir that's how we called him and i was kind of imagining a figure very much like that and so in my head the most true form pt sir felt like the most true name to give him rather than some other different name so i stuck with that and i wonder you know i wonder how it reads to somebody who is not really used to calling their teacher pt sir or anything like that but that's one of the freedoms that you have as a writer of fiction is 
sometimes sometimes you can just go with your intuition i actually loved it i think all of us who have grown up in india have had a pt sir and also <laughs> we were discussing that how the description of pt sir is sort of national like all pt sirs have same persona so for me it was great yeah. that he had no name he was just pt sir i also want to talk about jeevan of course she's the main character at least how i read the book so you can see that she is very strong headed and she has some ambition she wants to climb out of poverty and you can see that from how she works she leaves school and she also is so proud of her ability to buy a phone and you also can see that later when she's in the prison and you can see how she's trying to get out of it she has a scrappy quality to her but the way the book ended i mean not to give anything away but the way book ended i was actually hoping for a different ending like reading a lot of fiction you kind of have hopes for things to change in the end was there a specific reason that you chose this ending did you think it's more reflective of the real state of how things are going did she really have no hope <laughs> Well, I love that you are still thinking about what could happen to her story beyond the margins of the book. That's really moving to hear, so thank you for that. You know, I was thinking about I wanted to write this character who, of course, like you're saying, tries her best to get out of her predicament and she's always trying, you know, she tries to keep her place in school she tries to bring a journalist in to whom she can tell her story but in the end i felt that the book was interested in the might of the state what recourse people have when they are faced with the oppressive might of the state when they are faced with a state which is able to impose a certain narrative on you even if that is not the narrative you would claim for yourself so in many ways it became this kind of battle of dual narratives and i guess i felt that giving this character a victory it rang false to me it rang a little bit like the book would lack a certain courage but of course that's you know me thinking through it in one way and i'm sure there are a thousand other ways to think about it yeah i can see I that think... it definitely was more real like mm. in the climate it was set in but did you consider an alternate ending I considered endings where lovely and pt sir act differently endings where their success is more pure because i think in the current ending and i'm trying to say this without giving away too much for people who haven't had a chance to dip in yet their success in the end or the forms of success that they have i feel are morally polluted because of what they did or didn't do and i wondered if there were ways to keep them more pure and to keep them acting in accordance with their ideals and who they they would have wanted to be but in the end it felt more narratively interesting to think about well maybe people end up being selfish and that is again a strike against the society where somebody might feel that either they rise or somebody else rises you know you can't lift everyone up that's very true i kept thinking all through the book how would i have acted in the situation if i was in the situation of lovely or pt sir and if i wasn't even you know in their economic strata maybe even if i was a middle class person how would i have acted in a situation like this and i kept thinking about it i kept thinking about it and i wanted to say no i would have acted differently but in the end you know you know how you would act in your heart and i was like maybe i would have just acted the same you know the way they did and that what makes this book so real the story so real for me yeah Because... and you're right kyati it's easy to be idealistic in our heads right. but when you are in a situation where the state is so powerful you barely have any rights and the only chance at succeeding or surviving you get you are going to take it Yeah, I mean, thank you both for reading it so thoughtfully and bringing so much of your own imagination and experience and knowledge to the book. It's really a dream to be read with so much care. Oh, it was our pleasure. It was such a great. Yeah. 
Today's episode is brought to you by Naked Nutrition. Naked Nutrition provides you with pure protein powders and supplements to help you meet your nutrition and fitness goals. Naked Nutrition is completely transparent about their ingredients. That way you know exactly what is going into your body. No additives means your body gets more of what it needs and I suggest checking out their products. Right now you can get 10% off your first purchase at nakednutrition.com by using the code POD. That's 10% off using the code POD for first time customers. Take your nutrition to the next level with Naked Nutrition. We also want to talk about Family Solutions International. They are looking for potential egg donors and surrogate women between 21 to 30 years of age. They have a general good health record for egg donors and have had successful pregnancies. They are looking to find good-hearted people who need help conceiving or who want to be a blessing to a couple and help their dreams of a family come true. They have over 21 years of experience as an agency and they provide a personal case that is there every step of the way. You can find out more about them from their website familysolutionsinternational.com. So we noticed that Jeevan is the only character that you have written in first person. So what was your idea behind that? That's a great question. And I really, I toggled back and forth for a while. I think I wrote her passages in third and then I went back and I went back again. So it was really a process of figuring out what felt true for that character. In the end, I decided to keep Jeevan in first because I felt that her bodily experience of moving through the world was really important and I wanted to bring the reader as close as possible to that experience to have them feel what it is like. For instance, early in the book, there is a scene where um, she's in a police station and a policewoman kind of grips her arm and um, she wonders if there is anything kind or gentle in that grip. And I felt like that kind of observation, which I wanted to make, I could only make if it was in first and if I was, you know, really close to her. Um, but I love this writerly question. Can I ask if, if you both write fiction as well? It's my dream to eventually write something, but I'm not putting any active effort, so I will not call myself any writer yet. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this is a hard year to do it. How about you, Kathy? No, I don't write at all like I mean I do write blogs and stuff but not fiction okay cool mm -hmm. cool can I ask how you like came together to form this podcast because you're clearly just very caring and very generous readers and I I can see that I mean you both seem to write a little bit even though you don't want to talk about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah we just came through books actually that's how we became friends we had joined a book club that's where we met and then we realized that we want to talk about books a lot more than other people around us did so we thought why not make our own book club and that's how this started <laughs> that's amazing that's so cool and thank you for the compliment actually like yeah <laughs> I guess we'll stop with book-related questions now because we don't want to give too much of it away. Instead, we'll ask you, what are you reading now? I just read a galley of this book, which is coming out next year. It's by, it's a book of nonfiction and it's called The Good Girls. Let me see if I have my copy here. I don't think I do, but it's called The Good Girls. It's by Sonia Falero, who is a writer of nonfiction primarily. Um, and it follows this real case, which happened in Uttar Pradesh a few years ago, where two girls disappeared and were then found dead in a very, very tiny village in UP. And the book follows the case, the investigation, what happened and the life of the village and the customs of the village. And it's very, very insightful about media, justice, corruption. I found it a really powerful book. So I was reading that, which comes out next year. And then a book which is already out, which I'll mention because I loved it, is a book of short stories called A House is a Body by Shruti Swami. And the short stories are just so beautiful. They are all about the interior lives of women and families. And one of them I was thinking about is actually set during forest fire in the Bay Area. And it's following the thoughts of this mother as she's watching this fire outside her house. Um, anyway, that's called A House is a Body by Shruti Swami. I've seen that one. And I think I added that to my never ending reading list. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. What have you loved recently? Your book. 
Yeah. <laughs> And we also read this nonfiction by Arlen Hamilton. Uh, we also covered it on the podcast recently. I think that was also a great book. Yeah, I think I also liked Girls Burn Brighter by Shobha Rao. Yeah, I haven't read that one. I need to read it. Yeah, it's also very powerful. And like you said, you're reading another book about something set in UP. I think you probably would find some similarities there. And are you working on any new projects? Something that we can look forward to? I am but you know it's going very very slowly. I have a full-time job and I have had this full-time job the whole time that I've been writing a burning and you know this year being what it is it has been pretty hard to find that place of deep focus and concentration where you can really escape into your work so it's it's uneven but i am chipping away at it and i'm trying to be compassionate with myself and sometimes there are days where there's just too much going on and i can't find time for writing and that's okay because it's there and i'll come back to it yeah we hope you do because we are looking forward to <laughs> yeah, we are just it. waiting to read something else by you thank you so much <laughs> and i think we are done with all the important questions but before we end do you want to say anything to our listeners oh well i would just send a lot of energy to everybody who is writing or everybody who is perhaps reading with a lot of thoughtfulness right now and supporting writers in this year people who are making their own forms of art whether that is writing or maybe you're painting or maybe you're making music or you're practicing some other skill um just sending a lot of energy to everybody who is trying to make something and preserve a space of creativity in their own life right now That's such a great message. I felt it was directed at me. So I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad, Dama. <laughs> Thanks, Mega, for coming on our show, and thank you for discussing with us a lot of the questions. We always like when it's not a Q and A and it's sort of a discussion. So, and you made that happen. So, thanks for that. <laughs> and thank you both so much. We absolutely loved your book, like we said, and we are looking forward to your future work, and we hope it comes out soon. Thank you so much Kathy. Thank you so much Daman and I will look forward to reading your own writing in some uh-huh. form in future years. <laughs> Thank you so much Mega. This was our conversation with Mega Majumdar, the author of a compelling work of fiction, A Burning. She was a great guest and we truly enjoyed having her on. We absolutely enjoyed discussing her book, her inspiration and creative process, and we are eagerly waiting for her next project. And now this is our goodbye for 2020. See you next year. Until then, keep listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of Brown Girls Read podcast. If you like what you hear, please leave us a five star rating and a comment. You can support us at anchor.fm/browngirlsread/support. Your support will allow us to continue this podcast and bring more episodes to you. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Instagram Brown Girls Read Pod and Brown Girls Read One on Twitter. If you have book recommendations for us, you can leave us a comment or message on our social media, and you can also subscribe to us on YouTube for more content.